Today's stories begin in Alaska for the nation's earliest waterfowl hunt of the season. We're going along with some Alaska residents in the Susitna Flats Wildlife Refuge. Then it's another wildlife harvest as an established colony of honeybees gets in the way of a house painting project. Instead of getting out the bee swatter, we get a visit from Dan and Dan for a bee relocation effort. We've got bee catching today at its finest. Welcome to Season Chasers. I'm Rob Freeman. Those that love nature and outdoor sports spend a lot of quality time looking for adventure throughout the year. The more you study, the more you learn about the peak seasons in nature. It's fun to know when it's best to go fishing or hunting, when it's time to pick blueberries, wild mushrooms, or native pecans. Sometimes the peak season is close to home, right in your own backyard, or it could be miles away near the mountains and the sea. Either way, this program will chase the seasons where the action is hot. The season is late summer. It's September 1st. It's opening day for waterfowl hunting up in Alaska. I'm in the blind with Eric, Ted, and Dan. They're Alaska residents who find their way over to the duck flats almost every year right here on opening day. They came out the night before to put out their decoys and a moving wing mojo. They're tucked in the grass along with Eric's new bird dog, Belle. And it's almost time for the fast-flying Alaska ducks. The waterfowl migration begins up north with these birds heading for their warmer winter climate down the Pacific Flyway. This is the first wing shooting of the season. It's a time to check out your equipment and do your best to sharpen up your aim. The boys are set up in their favorite marsh out in the Susitna Flats. We're more than a mile from the Cook Inlet coastline, but we're only a few feet above sea level. We know for sure that the water in this marsh is really shallow, but still great for ducks. Today, everyone has on chest waders, and we're using the two-legged retrievers, and Bell is not happy about Garden the Blind. Eric. Now there aren't many bird dog breeders up here in Alaska, so Eric purchased Belle from a breeder in Georgia, and he had her flown to Anchorage.
pretty tough for a young puppy to sit still with all this activity going on. But Eric wants a year-round companion dog, and this trip is some good training. Off in the distance, the morning light begins to fall on the Alaska Range. These mountain peaks support snow all summer long, and they're fixing to get a lot more snow and ice this fall. The biggest peak up there is Mount Spur. It's the continent's northernmost active volcano. During a mid-morning break in the action, how about a few honks on the duck call? That just goes to show you can't please everybody every time, especially when the call loses important parts. Well, the ducks are flying anyway. This time, Ted and Dan are guarding the blind, while Eric wades the marsh. All three of us were shooting at that one duck, otherwise I might have gotten away. <laughs> That's uh, nine, nine rounds. And then ten to finish. Mojo keeps on a turning, and we keep our eyes to the skies. We got a pretty simple setup today. It's a sheet of camo behind our seats that breaks up our silhouette outline. By now, the sun's getting pretty high, and fewer ducks are flying around. Okay, here we are an opening morning up in Alaska for the waterfowl season. And uh, we've exceeded Belle's attention span here already. How about that? She's been a pretty good trooper here this morning, but uh, we've seen some action early on. What do you think, guys? How does this compare with other years? Pretty slow. A little slow. But, you know, that's tough time. We had a few good... Uh, Flybys, quite a few groups came into the beak, so can't complain. Tide's, tide's still moving up. Tide's still moving in. Hopefully that brings some birds off the flats out there. And if you see them moving, we'll stick around a while longer. That's about 9.30. We've been out here three hours. Well, we got maybe half a dozen birds. So yeah, slow so far, but you never know. Now, in addition to the waterfowl, the skies today are unusually quiet uh, due to the no-fly zone uh, for the presidential visit. And uh, haven't had quite as many hunters out here as usual either. No, no, usually you can hear a lot of shotgunning going on around you, but not this year. A lot less water this year, too. Very dry. This Alaska opening morning yields eight smaller ducks for this group. The daily limit up here is eight per shooter. We end up with seven or eight there. As you can see, 
Belle is most interested in these new scents and smells. She can look forward to more trips like this along with Eric, and it's clear that the sound doesn't seem to bother her. So that was a widgeon, the last one I tasted. Only one shoveler out of the bunch. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's, That's good. good. That's good shoot. That's not exactly the best eaters. <laughs> Are they mud flavored? Yeah. They are. <laughs> they are mud flavored with a dash of. Mud flavored with a dash yeah. of blood flavor. The sunny weather probably cut down on today's action. But this area is a famous destination for some serious Alaska waterfowlers. Hunters fly in on float and bush planes and even camp under the wing to hunt these marshes during duck season. And this has been a really fun outing for Bill. These guys flew into Ted's cabin before the flight ban in order to hunt up here this year. And that's why there's fewer people. This place is way off the highway grid. It is one beautiful opening day. It was probably 32 degrees at dawn and it's probably going to hit mid 60s by today I would guess based on what it feels like. Alaska's waterfowl hunting is quite a bit different than the hunts I've done down here in the Midwestern Flyway. The majority of ducks flying up here are this year's hatch they've never experienced hunting pressure. By the time the survivors travel south for the November season that I'm used to, they're much more wary of people, dogs, and any kind of movement. In a few weeks, all the ducks up here will be gone, heading for their winter grounds in California and Mexico. Next, we're getting up off the ground, and we're prospecting for gold honey. We're hoping to relocate a colony of wild bees. Don't worry, we're all a safe distance from this operation as we gather the honeycomb and try to get these bees to occupy a new hive. Hopefully we'll get some honey to store up for later. We'll study, learn, and share a bee roundup next on Season Chasers. Blue Ribbon Farm and Home has about everything you need for every season. Decorations for all seasons. Homes and treats for wild birds. New saddles and supplies for your ponies. Dog collars and pet grooming aids. Plus grills and recipes for barbecue season. Whether you have a lap dog, a sport dog, chickens, or a goofy goat, Blue Ribbon Farm and Home has all the feeds you'll ever need. Blue Ribbon Farm and Home. Rated outstanding by the Goofy Goat. When it's time to buy a better boat, Albers is the place to get your best deal on a new Tracker or Nitro. Albers Marine, Arma, Kansas. Trade up to a new Tracker. Ready for the lake. Powered by Mercury Outboards. Albers Marine, Arma, Kansas. Your ticket to the great outdoors is Tracker from Albers Marine. Albers Marine, Arma, Kansas. Your tracker and nitro boats dealer, North Highway 69, Arma, Kansas. Come on out to Pawnee Wildlife Preserve where it's pheasant season now through the end of March. And some people don't think of eastern Kansas as a place for wild pheasants, but I guarantee there's no slow flying ones out here. Give us a call at the number on your screen and come on out Cut. for a nice day in the country at Pawnee Wildlife Preserve, Fort Scott, Kansas. Say hello to Dan and Danny Mosier. There's some nearby neighbors who specialize in the art of beekeeping. Now I learned the hard way that it's almost impossible to paint an old house with an established bee colony on the second floor. It got to the point that I needed expert help to try to relocate these bees. 
Dan brought all the special equipment you need when you handle wild bees, starting out with a little smoke to calm them down. They think the world's coming to an end and they'll start sucking up honey in the hive. When they do, they don't move very fast and they I think they're starting to come to life up there. Yeah, the guard bees. Both Dan and his son Danny wear protective suits, hoods, and gloves while they prepare the new hive, the catch and vacuum box, and the power and hand tools needed to reveal this hive. Now kids, don't you be trying this at home, at least without expert supervision. your first impression of what you see there? Uh, some dark comb, some pollen stored here. It means the honey's probably up a little higher. Honey is mainly their carbohydrate source, so they store they store pollen as well as honey. The pollen they pack in these cells with with some honey and nectar. All right, what do we got here? Honey, it's been capped off right here. That's what they've been working on up there, huh? I'm really surprised they're not more upset than they are. Now I'm really glad that it's Dan up on that ladder. I don't think I could be quite fast enough to get out of the way in an all-out emergency. This looks like trouble to me. Wow, there's another row in there, isn't there? Oh yeah. That's what concerns me. That's pollen. What do you got here? Pollen. They've been storing in there. I'm gonna go out and get the go to the flowers and get pollen out of them. A little bit of honey on that one more. What do you got here? This is uh just more worker bees. Uh, pollen stuffed into this honeycomb stored away for winter food. I'd say this is the really itchy part where Dan dismantles a colony that's been here for many years. No wonder nobody wanted to paint up here. It's quite a team effort up here. Both have the patience and the calm demeanor to handle a powder keg like this. Oops, sorry. Honey buckets full. Yeah. Can we get the other one? Yeah. Okay. 
taking pictures of bees, it's probably good to be really, really still. <laughs> Here's some of the harvested honeycomb. Some will feed the bees in their new home in this white hive. Now Danny gets a turn on the ladder, operating the big bee vacuum. The workers, and hopefully the queen, will end up down in the catch box. Now Dan, what are some of the benefits uh, to us of this raw honey? Um, I've had a lot of people, honey customers of mine, claim that Being a doctor, I don't make any claims on what my honey can cure or not cure, other than the fact that it's tasty. Um, it's supposed to be a little better balance of sugars because it's a combination of several different sugars, as opposed to just uh, plain white cane sugar, which is predominantly Does it go on forever? Well, I hope not. <laughs> start. That all looks like honey stuff too, isn't it? Yeah. Is that prime comb there? Honey's got there in the pan, Danny, that's not capped off. Mm -hmm. Take it out and set this capped off comb in there. Okay. And the, give him a pan full of this comb that's capped off. It's going to be. Into this, um, this hive over here. Is that to make him feel at home? Um, yeah. And uh, usually I put more than that, but I, and I, when I get it home, I, I will put more than that on there. But, uh, what uh, Danny was doing was taking this comb and cutting it to the right length and rubber band it on there. And then the bees, and I'll probably do some more, what I was looking for was a bunch of brood comb that had their eggs and larvae and stuff. And that's usually what I put in here with some food. And let's try to save all of that that I can. Uh, that's why I didn't put very much, very many, uh, type, much of the comb on here, but we'll probably do that at home. What happens is those bees will come in here and they'll stitch this all in. They'll uh, build wax from the frame to that comb all along here and just make it their, make just kind of a repair job, make it their home. Who'd you stop to ask? Now this honey over here, you're going to use some of that right. to leave as their food source for the winter. Right. Some of it I'll probably go through there and take some of these plates like this now that I don't have brood comb and put those plates in there. And then and you'll probably take some of my old, I've got some old comb like this one here that already has comb built onto it. And I'll put some of that and fill in with that just to give them a head start on the winter and make sure they're kind of a tough time to take them out because they don't have any flowers to go to to start building new reserves for the winter. So you have to provide them all the food that they're going to need for the winter to keep them going. And it doesn't always work, but we do the best we can when they've got to come out of a wall or a tree. Well, you got most of them out of there, that's for sure. The ones that remain are pretty confused.
but we'll get to put this back together and paint the whole house. It's accomplished for now. Well, wait, there's still an opportunity that I haven't, you know, there's a possibility that I haven't got the queen out of there and that she may stuck, be stuck in a crack up there. And uh, if these bees hang around any more than a few days, I may have to come back and uh, do a little more work on getting the rest of them out. Take a look inside the catch box. These will be released once the new hive is set. And hopefully that'll be a long, long ways away from here. How often do you get to do this sort of thing? Oh, I don't know. It's probably four, five times a year, six times a year. That I get called to do cutouts. What? Not very often. Yeah, not very often. And I've got another. I've got another removal going on right now. That's a, a trap out, as opposed to cutting them out like this, where the house couldn't be taken apart to get them out. I'm uh, trapping them out of a house. That usually takes a few weeks to get done. All right. Well, and they're uh, usually uh, up on the second floor instead of where they're easy to get to, right? Well, they're they're, they're very rarely easy to get to. Yeah. But that's probably one reason they've they've survived so long in this spot is because they've been up off the ground and away from predators. You think? Sure, they haven't been bothered. Well. Thanks for taking care of the bees. Well, that's the thing. We didn't want to kill these, and and uh, there is a bee shortage, and they do a lot of good. Yeah, yeah, they're they're great pollinators. Great to have around. And what we only had one sting today that got up under your pant leg. Well, I think that's pretty amazing. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's always a good day. All right. Well, I didn't get stung any, and that's particularly uh, interesting to me. But thanks again for. Uh, getting these guys and taking them for a ride today. Well, we sure hope these guys enjoy the their new home where you're taking them. Well, we're going to give it the best shot we can to make sure they do. All right, well, thanks again for uh, getting these out of here, and I can finish this painting project. Walker, walker. Tune in each week for some of the stuff you just won't see on other shows. Outdoors, wildlife, and a life of adventure. Being on the lookout for natural foods and making the most of what the wildlife provides. Study, learn, and share the great outdoors with someone who's important to you.